if you made half the money and at the end of the day, you had time to go for a walk and felt really good, it's just better success. But we just don't live in a world that encourages us to define the success as feeling good. You're listening to The Successful Bookkeeper with your host, Michael Palmer. Listen each week as inspiring guests share their secrets of success to help you increase your confidence, work smarter, and build a business you love. This episode of The Successful Bookkeeper is brought to you by purebookkeeping.com, the proven system to grow your bookkeeping business. Welcome back to the Successful Bookkeeper Podcast. I am your host, Michael Palmer, and we have a special two-part series for you involving Dr. Aaron Reeves, who is the President and Managing Director at Nexions LLC, which is a cutting-edge research and consulting firm that focuses on leadership and inclusion. In part one, we'll discuss why bookkeepers need rules about handling bad clients, including having a special tax for them. And I know you're going to love this conversation. So let's jump right into the interview now. Dr. Aaron N. Reeves, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. Excited to be here. It's great to have you. And uh, I know this topic's going to be very, very, very interesting and certainly in the climate of today. Uh, and I'm really looking forward to it. And before we do that, though, I'd love for our listener to get to know you a little bit better. Tell us about your career journey leading up to this point. Yeah, I'd love to and I'm excited to have this conversation. I was, um, you know, when I went to undergrad, I I thought I was going to be a lawyer and I was going to be a lawyer for life, right? So I went to law school, have always been interested in um, racial, gender, social justice type issues and loved law school, loved practicing law, but realized that it wasn't exactly what I wanted to do. I wanted to do more in terms of preventing bad things from happening than, um, especially in workplaces, than necessarily dealing with them after they happened like the law does. So made the tough decision to go back to school, um, did a doctorate in um, neurobehavioral sociology. So really focused on our brains and how they impact how we interact sort of in groups. Um taught at Northwestern for a while. um, And all of that kind of, all of those different experiences combined together to me saying, I wanted to bring the academics, the law, the writing, the research um, in one place. And this was over 20 years ago and there wasn't really any place that did that. So I started my own firm and um, going strong 20 years later, we work with organizations um, across the world on, all things related to inclusion and leadership, but I specifically focus on differences of all kinds. So gender, race, sexual orientation, but also cross-cultural, global, religious, um, language, personality, all of the different types of differences. And so in the course of that, I take the research and put it into books as well. You've written a few books. Yes. And- yes. And so a couple of them that I'll mention, um, The Next IQ, One Size Never Fits All, and Smarter Than a Lie. And your, your, this would be your latest book, if we're correct here, is In Charge, The Energy Management Guide for Badass Women Who Are Tired of Being <laughs> Tired. Yes. <laughs> I'd say that's a gr- I love the title. <laughs> yes. My first book was about implicit bias. It was, uh, I write all books to to not be academic, but it it was more sort of rooted in neurobehavior, et cetera, um, of implicit bias. The second one, One Size Never Fits All, was about women and how women develop business very differently than men do. They develop their networks very differently, grow businesses very differently. Not all men, not all women, but they do do it differently. The third one was about lying in workplaces, who lies, um, and interesting correlations about people in power actually lie more than people without power, and there were some gender issues there as well. And this last book is probably my most different, because while the first three really did focus on research um, 
both, um, you know, independent research that I was doing as well as secondary research in the marketplace. This one was a little bit more personal. So um, I talk in the introduction that this book I wrote as a fellow traveler of somebody who is tired of being tired and what that means and what does energy management mean um, as opposed to the first three. Wow. I mean, there's a couple of things that come up out, out of that. And one is my question about you were very interested in inclusion. What, what do you think in your life led you to that topic? I think some of that was just very personal. I grew up, um, I was born in one country, raised in three different countries before coming to the United States. And I was raised in countries with very different religions, different languages. And I was probably in, gosh, over probably a dozen schools by the time I got to the United States as a teenager. And I think this idea of what does it feel to belong and how does it feel to be different and what does it mean to not belong were just issues I um, was curious about, grappled with my whole life. And the United States just has such an interesting mix of dealing with these issues that I was always very interested in that. And I think the idea of justice was always something that is just a deep value of mine. And what does it mean to be fair or not fair? Um, So inclusion, you know, it started with kind of justice and inclusion, and they all kind of just morphed into something that became my career. It's really interesting. I mean, what a, what a, incredible background. I mean, 12 different schools, uh, different countries, and you can start to appreciate the view that you would have versus other people who've maybe been in the same place or raised in a the same community. Uh, so the, the viewpoint is very interesting, especially for today's climate globally. The the other question it was interesting around the books and how the how women in business go about growing a business. Tell us a little bit more about that because I mean, our listener is, more, a lot of our listeners are female growing their business. And I, I think it's important for one to know though themselves. You can imagine that if you're looking at how other people are growing their business and if, if a woman is looking at a, a how men are doing it, they might think to themselves, well, geez, I'm doing it wrong. And well, but maybe they're doing it right. Uh, right, exactly. Um, <laughs> probably, probably, probably they're doing, they're it, doing right. it right. <laughs> but it's also, you know, kind of going back to the title, it's about if you're going to imitate what somebody else is doing, trust me, you're going to do it terribly. Right. Mm-hmm. And so women, there's a lot of sort of evolutionary biology and neurology and all of that. And I won't go into that. But the bottom line is women are actually much, much better at, uh, building relationships and growing relationships and creating trust in relationships. What they're not as good at doing as men in the way that we talk about business is extracting value from those relationships, right? So it's building relationships is different than asking for business or asking for a sale. So what my research showed was That if you look at just the developing the relationships piece, developing the network piece, developing the trust piece, women actually outscored and outperformed men. But the minute you said, well, are you going to ask for the business? Are you going to ask them for something? That is when women really kind of shied away and said, well, I'm not comfortable asking. I don't want them to feel like you know, I'm taking advantage of the relationship. So women are less likely, for example, to lean on family and friends for financial support. Uh, Women are less likely to, you know, ask a complete stranger for business. Now they're likely to ask for help, which is very different. (laughs) And it gets into all of these, like, how do we define help? How do we define sale? How do we define all of these things? But sort of the good news part of the story is that What I also discovered in the research is that when women developed business collectively, when they grew their businesses as part of a community, oh my goodness, it just skyrocketed. So when women see themselves as alone in the journey, when they see themselves as I am this business owner, I have to do this, that is when they really struggle with 
the business. And to be really honest, they're not having fun at it and it just sucks to do it. So that's why women don't like it and they don't, uh, they tend to say they're not successful at it. It's more that they just don't really like it that way. But when women get together and say, let's do this as a community or let's build this together, all of those, you know, and I use the term weaknesses very, very loosely here, but all of those challenges, weaknesses just suddenly blossom into strengths. So the biggest takeaway there is connect with other women, build a community of women. And if you and one other woman are doing something, both of your chances of success like quadruple, as opposed to each of you trying to do it on your own. Very interesting. So, well, very, I mean, it's uh, validating for this community, the successful bookkeeper community, because that is what we created, a community for bookkeepers, men and women, but there are many women in the industry. And so many women in this community and and I've I've always um, known, I mean, community is powerful for all all people. However, this is, for women, it's especially important and they will do and fare better by being in a community where they feel that they belong exactly. and that they can flourish in that. So that's wonderful to note and, and exciting. And, you know, it's interesting because I do note that, like, when I have a relationship with somebody, the dynamic is different. And so that can be challenging to pivot to, well, I need money from you. You know, right. like it'd be like working with a friend and then having to charge the money for the things that I do. I mean, it's just, for me, it's always been different. And so if women are really strong at building relationships, you can see how that other side of it can be a challenge. And then around that specific point, because in business, it is important to make asks, ask for the business. Often we, in this community, many struggle around raising the prices. You know, it's like, I'm your friend. And now you know, well, I shouldn't say friend because it's not really about, but I have a strong relationship with you. I've nurtured that relationship with you almost to the point of being a friend. And now I want you to pay me more money. It it can be foreign. How would our listener, if they're women, take that on in their life? You know, and this is a little autobiographical too as well, but I found that, again, I approach everything from kind of a, why is our brain doing that? Like, why is my brain fighting me on doing this, right? And the idea of a friend or like an associate or those terms sometimes I think trip us up. What really helps is if you stop and you say, I care, right? I can care about different people in very different ways. I have two teenage kids. I care about them deeply. I have clients. I care about them as well. Those are two different types of caring, but it's coming from the same place in me, right? Like it's the value of caring is not different for me, whether I am caring about my kids, whether I'm caring for my kids, whether I am caring about clients, or I just care what's happening in my community, or I care about what's happening in the world, or I care about what's happening in Ukraine. It's I care. And that is a big part of who I am. And so trying to identify like friend versus acquaintance versus associate versus coworker versus, ah, like my brain goes dead on those, right? So really saying I care. And then you have to add yourself to the mix. And I care about myself too. And I can't care about all of these other people. And I can't care about what I care about in this world if, I, if I'm if i not okay to contribute. So if I'm not okay to be the best mom that I can be, if I'm not okay to be the best, you know, consultant or advisor that I can be, if I'm not okay to be the best friend um, that I can be. So once you start thinking about it from the perspective of caring and what allows you to care effectively or care in the way that you want to care, that's when you can start really looking at, well, what does it mean to ask for business? I have never asked for business. I don't even know how to do that. So I would not know how to give you any advice on that. (laughs) But what I do know is I'm really good at what I do. And I know that I work really, really, really hard. And I know that I will read more than 
anyone else on any problem that I'm trying to solve. And that's what I tell people. Like, I, I care about this problem that you're trying to solve and I want to help you solve it, right? That is my pitch. And when people say, why should we hire you over someone else? Because I care more than other people. I really do. And because I care more, sometimes I may end up caring about your problem more than you care about it, right? I care about you solving this problem. So I don't care about the solutions that I'm about to give you. I care about you solving it. So that's what I can help you do. That's my language. That's what fits me. Mm. So I think what you know your listeners do is they help people. They help people do things that people really, really, really don't want to do, me included, right? Like they, mm-hmm. they help people do stuff. It's a caring. You're saying, I care about your business, right? I am helping you care about your business. And so give me a chance to help you care about your business or let me work with you to care about this together. That's the kind of language that I use. And the business development research is we're not allowed to say we care in the same way in the business world, but it really resonated with women. I tell women all the time, like, you know, or even when I'm pitching in quotes, you know, male clients, I'll say, look, I like to have fun. I like, I'm really intellectually curious. Uh, so if it, if it gets boring, if it's not curious, or if I don't care about the problem that you're trying to solve, I will let you know, and it's probably not a good fit. But as long as I'm curious and I'm having fun, care, I mean, I tell my team, I tell them, we have fired clients when they're assholes. We have a no asshole rule. Like, no, because you were making it difficult for me to care when you're being an asshole, so we don't care to work with you. And we've had to say that to people before. So I think use the language that works and you don't have to. I think our, I think our listeners are going to like the language of no asshole rule. Yeah, it's, it's huge. <laughs> and I love, the way you've, I love the way you've put it. And I mean, what's interesting is I think our listeners love you already because what, just talking about the way you talk about caring, I mean, it comes across so many of the the bookkeepers that we've interviewed on this podcast. And I mean, I've worked with hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of bookkeepers, bookkeeping business owners, male and female. It's a caring industry. I mean, they, they care. They don't get into this business if they don't care deeply about somebody else because they are doing really, really challenging things, difficult things. And often they'll care more about their clients' money yes. and business than, than their, their, their owner does. And so that can be dangerous if you don't have a no asshole role. Yes. And it also is dangerous when, because caring is something, and this goes to the energy management, caring is something that doesn't feel like it should have a boundary, right? Like, when do you stop caring? And at what point does caring become too much? Because caring seems like it's a forever positive thing. And that's where you have to remind yourself that you're in the mix too. Like you have to care about yourself too. And as long as you're caring about yourself, then if you care about somebody and it is preventing you from caring about yourself, uh, that's where the no asshole rule begins, right? It is if you're not in the mix of who you care about, that's when it all goes to shit because it's the same thing as a mom. If I don't care about me, I will burn out. And if one of my children has an emergency, I mean, my daughter is a sophomore in college now. If she has an emergency and I haven't had sleep for two nights, I'm not going to be very useful to her as a mother, especially because she's thousands of miles away. So this idea of it's so important to care, but it is necessary and essential that you are in the universe of people that you care about. You don't always have to be front and center. You know, did that mask, put the mask on yourself before you put it on your kids thing. I never understood that. If three masks fell and I was sitting next to my two kids, I have no doubt in my life I would put the masks on them first. I don't know if it's a mother's instinct or it's just me. I can't always put myself first. It's not about always putting yourself first. It's about saying, I'm in this mix too. Like, 
I have to care about me too. Not always first, but so that's where the no asshole rule comes in is, listen, if anybody is doing anything, including people you love that are crossing the line into you being able to take care of yourself, you're no use to anybody else that you care about. And that is where you have to stop and say, oh, that's where the boundary is. Okay, got it. Like, you don't get to do this anymore. Or it's okay if I don't work with you anymore because I may make less money, but whoa, like I'll get a whole bunch of peace back or I'll get a whole bunch of... Oh yeah, um, it's all, it's all of that. The value exactly. exchange is, it's way out, out of balance. Exactly. Got an email from from uh, one of our clients recently, and and uh, their client, you know, she's been talking about this client for a very long time, and tolerating, and tolerating, 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 and it's it, it just got to the point where this email came. It was an abusive email, and and finally she made the choice to say, "That's it, you're done." Yep. And you know, she she tolerated because of the money exchange, right? Big client money coming in. She's tolerating it, wants the money, making that choice. That's her responsibility. She's making that choice. But at some point you got to go, is it worth the money that I'm getting, you know, for the, for what I'm getting back in return? And she's, she's finally made the decision. And what's beautiful about that and is that when any of us, when we make those, des- those decisions or choices, it opens a new door, yep. you know, it Always. creates a space for a great client to come and work with us. Always. I feel like we don't, we're not taught in our lives to add a value to our time. We charge for it, but we don't add value to it, right? So for example, um, I was talking to someone the other day about a client that I had to fire a while back and they said, well, how did you decide on the money? I said, well, if I was charging, you know, my client for the time that I air quotes, like did work for them, I was like, but if I really stopped and thought about all the time I should charge them. Every time I thought about them, if I charge them, right, they weren't worth the money because they were on my mind all the time because they were so terrible that if I had a call with them that morning, they were on my mind the rest of the day. They would ruin my mood the rest of the day. And I was just like, so if you build them for all the time you think about them, you realize, no, they're not worth the money, right? You're only thinking about billing the quote unquote work that you're doing. On the flip side, I've got clients who are just so nice and care about me in return. And yeah, they may it may be less money than than other clients, but they give me more back in my day. You know, like I feel good after I talk to them. And th- that's the energy management piece is one of the things in researching this that really hit home for me, and it's been a lesson I've been learning, I think, over the years, but really kind of hit home. Success doesn't mean anything if you're miserable. Like financial success doesn't mean anything if you're exhausted and feel like shit. And if you made half the money and at the end of the day, you had time to go for a walk and felt really good, it's just better success. But we just don't live in a world that encourages us to define the success as feeling good. We're encouraged to define success as achieving something. And what's the point if you feel like shit at the end of the day? So it really kind of recalibrating around that is where the book kind of came from too. And that's why I said it's a fellow traveler book because it'd be great if I was excellent at executing on all the stuff I write about. But I'm still learning and I don't do it well every day. And I have great values that I don't always live up to and have to calibrate every day to say, remember, you said that was important. Can we go back to that? It's it's just a, it's a daily journey to kind of come back to center on those things. I love that. I, I mean, it's, it's important for us to all remind ourselves and everyone else, like we're not here to be perfect. Exactly. We're here to continually evolve. You said something that, I just loved it, this whole concept of like considering how often we're thinking about a client. I, I, I don't think I've ever heard of it put in that way in that if you calculated the time, 
that you were thinking about somebody or their their business and often negative clients you would think about them often and it wouldn't you could think about a good client but the feelings would be good but there's this feeling of uh remorse or dread or whatever i mean that's just not not great and i i i love that and i think it'll be very valuable for our listener to consider that when they're considering the clients is to take that into consideration is that you know maybe you should be billing them when you think about it and have a negative feeling exactly. and if you have pushback from a client tell them it's like listen you don't like the bill? How about I charge you for all the times I'm thinking about you? Exactly. <laughs> you know, it's like, I just love that. Exactly. I mean, it's like the asshole tax, right? Like, I, and I, I literally said, I was talking to one of my colleagues, this is a few years ago, and I was like, we should literally just have a code, like AT. And internally, we know it's an asshole tax and that it's, we charge them for every time they were an asshole, but then we discount it. And don't let them, just, if they ask, we just go, oh, that's an internal billing thing. But we know that was the asshole task, tax that we discounted for you. So we count our discounts. So we look at kind of what we charged and what our discounts were. And we try to see like, what are we discounting for? Is there value in the discount, et cetera? So mm. the, just internally as a bookkeeping thing, right? You can do that is create an asshole tax for yourself and charge people for that, even if you're discounting it. And see how much of an asshole tax with each client you're getting and ask yourself, is it worth it, right? Like, would you recommend somebody keep someone that was paying that high of a tax on having a client? There's a lot of different ways to think about it, but we're just not taught that our feelings, our experiences with the world are as important to quantify as that unit of time that you bill or that degree that you have. And I, I think the hyper-focus on achievement makes us evaluate success in a way that doesn't always make us feel good. And mm. even when we achieve something, it's short-lived, right? Like we'll say, well, I want to hit this number for this month. And it's, you kill yourself doing it. And then great, you hit the number. But how long does that actually last? Um, it doesn't last very long because it's not something that's, you know, really making you feel good. And the idea of having energy management, I mean, like we've seen all of the studies over the last two years. Women came out of this pandemic or are coming out of this pandemic way more exhausted than men, um, way more like overwhelmed, kind of torn up than men. And I think it's, you know, that hitting the rock bottom kind of a feeling to what happened over the last two years where it's like, okay, you have a choice. Are you just going to put the pieces of your old life back in place? Or now that they're kind of knocked down, are you going to say, well, what do I want to put here? Like, how do I want to build this? Like, what do I want to do? Um, instead, I'm, I just think it's a real opportunity to to just ask ourselves those questions, even if we don't change anything overnight. To, and I you know, completely understand how we don't always have the financial bandwidth to make any sort of sudden moves. But as we start thinking about it, I think different ways of doing things open up to us because we're actively thinking about doing things differently. What a fun interview so far. In part two next week, we'll keep discussing how to handle bad clients and also talk about the concept of life hours. You are not going to want to miss it. And with that, we wrap another episode of the Successful Bookkeeper podcast. To learn more about today's wonderful guest and to get access to all sorts of valuable free business building resources, you can go to thesuccessfulbookkeeper.com. Until next time, goodbye. You've been listening to The Successful Bookkeeper with Michael Palmer. For more information and to download the resources mentioned in this episode, please visit us at thesuccessfulbookkeeper.com. Thank you for listening.